Well, hello, and um, kudos to all of you for staying here late on a Saturday afternoon. And I appreciate being invited by Dr. Avedon and Dr. Black. That was a fabulous lecture. I'm just thankful that I was allowed to be a part of this so I could learn so much from you. Uh, thank you very much. A lot of fun to talk about this topic. It's a, it's a very complicated topic, and all of us have to be invested in this. We have to be invested in it because that whole uh, tour de force that Dr. Black just took us through is happening at a great clip to our ICU patients. And the title that they chose for me was What Matters is the Mind. And the more I thought about the title, I, I think they really got it right. The mind is what is the most chronically diseased after critical illness. And it's why we've been studying this for the past 20 years in our center. And so I'm gonna to present to you today data from three new investigations that were all published within the last four or five months that will give you some, some direction, some focus, about where to go with your ideas about picking out who is at risk and what can you do about it. You see which one goes forward, I guess the green probably. Um, I am uh, disclosing here some conflicts of interest related to having given uh, CME activities in the past. I, like Dr. Black, do not have stock in these companies or have any particular interest in what their products are or whether or not you use them. I am NIH and VA funded and it was the PI for the SECM's ICU Liberation Collaborative, which I'm going to tell you about as we go through. Pratik Pandrapandi and I have a lot of fun being the co-directors of this SIB Center, the Critical Illness Brain Dysfunction Survivorship Center. This is about 70 or so of our 90 plus investigators at the SIB Center at Vanderbilt and the VA. One of our investigators is here tonight, Tina Bonsick. She studies antipsychotic use in critical illness, among other things related to psychoactive drug use. So Tina, thank you for being a part of our center. And I'm going to take you first, as, before we get to these three new studies, I've got to set up a little bit of a background, and then we will build on the new data. So a few years ago, Pratik and I, along with the rest of the investigators of the Brain ICU study, published this paper in the New England Journal, which was the first prospective NIA-funded investigation to document in a little over 1,000 patients that this was a dementia-like illness that our patients were, were acquiring during critical illness. One of the things, Dr. Black, that kind of stood out to me as you were presenting was just that all of that pathology was happening in non-critically ill patients. These are outpatients, and they're just living their life, and they're accruing these plaques and tangles. But what happens to our patients, you anesthesiologists, the creme de la creme of academic anesthesia critical care doctors in the world, is that our patients come in and they've been living their life. These patients in this study didn't have any baseline dementia, and they get this massive disruption of their blood-brain barrier and, a, and, a, and an onslaught of inflammation and coagulopathy. And then on top of that onslaught of coagulation and inflammatory disturbances, they then get pummeled with drugs that we think are there to help them, which I think and many of you think probably do a lot that doesn't help them. And so I was just, it was just thinking about that amount of pathology you showed and how our patients in a matter of 10 to 20 days can acquire so much added disease to their brains. Anyway, so just to review very quickly what we found, in this paper in the New England Journal, Pratik and I and the rest of us in the Brain ICU 1 study, which is relevant because there's about to be a Brain ICU 2 study, I'll get to that at the end, in Brain ICU we basically documented that over half of these patients were coming out with a dementia. It happened in young and old patients. If you even look at this graph here, it was even happening in 30 and 40 year olds. So 30 and 40 year olds, even with no pre-existing comorbidities, were leaving with an executive dysfunction and a global cognitive dysfunction, predominantly ruled by memory deficits. And phenotypically, it looked a lot like a dementia. We don't know the mechanism of this, and that's where I'm going to get to telling you about brain two, where we're getting the brains out of these ICU survivors once they die and setting up the first ever tissue repository of brains, CSF, and a lot of other body fluids to, uh, to try and figure out what exactly is this pathology. 
I was also thinking, Dr. Black, about those pie charts you showed of the vascular versus the plaques and tangles, et cetera, and I'm pretty certain that these patients are going to have a very interesting pie chart. Our goal, though, is to determine the pie chart and then figure out what to do about it. In this study, you as anesthesia experts and intensivists probably said, well, how do we put brain one into context with Newman's data from the cabbage literature in the New England Journal in the early 2000s? Um, and then with all of the, the arguing, nice academic arguing going on with Alex Evers and you, Michael, uh, saying, well, is it, is it the OR? Is it the drugs? Is it the anesthesia? Or is it not? And so we put together about 1,100 patients in this prospective cohort study, and Chris Hughes published this paper in Annals of Surgery, and we sliced and diced this every way that we could to try and accuse the OR, to try and accuse the anesthesia, accuse the drugs they received, et cetera. And basically, when you, the reason this study, I think, was so helpful was that we had a large number of surgical patients up against a large number of medical patients. And you can see that the, the medians and interquartile ranges for global cognitive dysfunction and for executive dysfunction just don't look any different in accordance with the medical versus surgical comparison. So after adjusting for length of time in the OR, type of anesthesia received, type of, o, uh, of operation conducted, ASA risk factors, and all of the things you might, you might ponder to be variants in the cause of this dementia, I think it's not about the OR. And I think this does support uh, some of uh, other people's hi recent hypotheses. Uh, but the question is, what is it? And what is happening in the ICU then that is leading to this long-term cognitive dysfunction? And there are some new studies which are helping us to point out who's at risk and who's, and who's not. So this is a recent study published just about a month and a half ago by Brian James and some other investigators that I'm working with, David Bennett, who was mentioned a moment ago, Julie Schneider, a famous neuropathologist, Raj Shaw, and, and Bob Wilson. And what we did here was we looked at 777 patients from the Rush Memory and Aging Project, followed them for over 10 years, and we looked at emergency versus non-emergency hospitalizations, and then did cognitive testing for working memory, episodic memory, semantic memory, speed, visuospatial, and so on. And it all boiled down to these two graphs. If you look at the left graph, I don't know if I have a pointer, I guess I don't, but if you look at the left graph in those two lines before the vertical at two years, you can see that from zero baseline and to two years, both, okay, that's a good idea, uh, right here, these patients have the same trajectory of cognitive decline out to two years. And then the patients were divided up into patients who never got hospitalized in black, and then those who were hospitalized in red. And you see this dramatic change in the trajectory of downturn of their cognition in this extremely robust prospective cohort study where we had them before they ever went into the hospital. But what the tale was told was on the second graph, when you divide this red line right here into emergent, or to elective versus non-elective hospitalizations. So what you can see is that the green patients who were the elective patients basically have the same trajectory as those never hospitalized, and all of the downturn in cognition comes from people who are not electively hospitalized. They were emergently hospitalized. And those are the people that we basically studied in brain one. Patients on mechanical ventilators, or in shock, etc. So that's why I think it supports the notion that this is not about elective OR procedures or even elective uh, medical hospitalizations either. Uh, what it's about is whether or not you're sick enough to get or whether or not you have inflammatory cascade, coagulopathy, or drugs that combine in a way that allow you to end up in a delirious state. So this is a graph from our Brain One study in the New England Journal that shows the most robust independent predictor that we could determine in that cohort study, which was duration of delirium. And um, one of the simplest things you can measure in the ICU actually in terms of organ dysfunction is delirium. With the CAM ICU, you can measure this in 37 seconds. It's free. We timed that with computers. 
And uh, it doesn't cost you any extra monitoring other than a good clinician going to the bedside to see if the patient is inattentive and having disorganized thinking, et cetera. And just that simple clinical bedside test of 30, 37 seconds can help predict that out to one year, every additional day of delirium that you had in the unit added about a 10% increased risk of mortality, independent of other covariates, and about a 35% increased risk of long-term cognitive impairment or this ICU-acquired dementia. So this leads me to the next and last two studies I'm going to present to you, and then we'll have our third speaker, and then we'll come up here and all have a Q&A session to take whatever questions you have. Um, and these last two tests get around this quote by Thomas Paine, uh, which was published in Common Sense over 200 years ago. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. This, this quote is right on so many levels for us in the ICU. We didn't think it wrong to keep people immobilized and heavily sedated in the ICU. We didn't think it wrong to be delirious in the ICU. We called it ICU psychosis and acted as though everybody can get psychotic in the ICU. It's no big deal, Grandma. Don't worry, Grandpa's crazy right now, but he'll get better. But will he? And we didn't think it wrong to give people potent antipsychotic medications like antipsychotics, which Tina Bonsick are studying, and finding out that about 50% of patients in brain one got antipsychotics, and a whopping one in four were still getting these drugs when they left the hospital. Why? We didn't even know that they were doing anything, much less the idea of putting them on them for months at a time. So let's take this quote into these last two studies I want to show you, and let's visit Ned Kassam. Ned Kassam is one of my heroes in the world of delirium. He was the chair of psychiatry for 25 years at, uh, at MGH, and about 40 years ago, almost a half a century ago, he had the idea of using antipsychotics for delirium. I knew of this one paper in 1978. He published a bunch that are in the peer-reviewed literature from 85 on, but it took me going into the bowels of the Royal um, Library in London to find this abstract in an old uh, annual meeting of the APA. And I did finally find this series of 15 patients, the first documented in the medical literature to receive antipsychotics for delirium. The hypothesis that he was using and that we tested in our Mind USA study was that Haldol, a D2 blocker, would help fix the neurotransmitter abnormalities going on in our delirious patient and help reduce the duration of delirium. We didn't know whether or not that was true or not, but 50 years after Ned Kassam, who I failed to mention was a stogie-smoking Jesuit priest doctor, um, true, well, 50 years later, his initial efforts actually led to a worldwide standard of practice whereby you can see in all these areas of the globe, the majority of physicians use these drugs to take care of our patients. But not knowing whether or not they worked, we decided to set up a randomized control trial called the Mind USA study. We got just under $10 million from the NIA and set up this 20-center randomized control trial. And at the end of the study, published just a few months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, we found out that these drugs did not do anything to reduce the duration of delirium. You can see on the top graph here that the time spent free of delirium and coma was around eight days um, out of 14, so about five, six days in delirium and coma, comprised of about five days here of delirium and about one or two days of coma, but they were the same across the Haldol, Zeprazidone, and placebo groups. We saw no shred of difference in hospital or ICU length of stay, time on the ventilator. We did not see a difference between hypo and hyperactive delirium either. I'm not going to belabor the point by showing you a bunch of other slides here, but suffice it to say that um, the answer to this question how to prevent brain sapping delirium in the ICU, in my, to my mind now, is pretty definitively shown. It's not about antipsychotics. And in fact, I didn't show you, but there were data that came out in 2005 in the New England Journal, JAMA and Lancet, that showed that these drugs pose an added risk of mortality, which is one of the great stimuluses for me to write that R01 to do MindUSA. 
And there have been other, three other randomized control trials of antipsychotics for delirium, both prevention and treatment, none of which have shown any difference in delirium duration. So look up here for a second. If this is the ICU exposure of risk of injury to the brain, and this is the post-ICU experience of long-term dementia, it does not look like giving or writing a prescription for antipsychotic in the acute setting does anything to the acute delirium, and we were just finishing our year data of long-term cognitive uh, outcomes in terms of the one and a half to two hour neuropsych tests of the Mind USA patients. So we'll publish that later in the year, but I highly suspect there'll be no difference among the three groups. So the answer to Richard Harris's NPR episode on this patient of mine, Randy and his wife Karen, is not writing a prescription. What the study did, though, helped us take our mind off of writing that prescription and turning our mind over to this idea of the fact that there are, and Dr. Black said that there are life habits for patients to prevent delirium, and you gave me the idea for the first time I've ever had it since you said that, that there are healthcare practitioner habits that we have to do in the ICU to help our patients prevent this. So I think after the unit, they have to establish their life habits to get their life back and their brain be protected before and after the unit. But in the unit, we are the ones in control of their bodies. In a very patronizing way, we have sedated, immobilized, and kept these patients from living, uh, living a very normal life. Granted, they're very sick, but with this bundle, this A2F bundle, which is essentially a safety checklist built with 40 Lancet, JAMA, and New England Journal papers, we have a way of changing our healthcare practitioner habits to do a better job for our patients. And I'm going to show you data in a minute that this bundle, the more it's complied with, reduces death, length of stay, delirium, coma, reduces ICU bounce backs, reduces nursing home transfers. You know, on the plane up here, we were dilly-dallying on the tarmac, and the pilot said, bear with us, we have two more checklists to finish, and then we'll be off. I was just rereading uh, Atul Gwande's checklist manifesto, and I had been thinking about checklists as a way of prevention of problems and, and of safety, but he points out a great example that the checklist is also what you do when a disaster occurs, you run the checklist and figure out what went wrong. And that is precisely the way that we use this safety checklist or this bundle. In our ICUs, we take, for example, just take the D, the delirium. By the way, so it's A, analgesia. B, both SATs and SBTs, which is turn off drugs, let the patient wake up, and shove that ventilator to off position or to, uh, to CPAP and, and spontaneous breathing. Be careful with your choice of analgesia and sedation. We try and avoid GABAergics as the main point of C so far. D is delirium. I'll show you the next slide. E, early mobility, and F, family. What this basically boils down to is awake patients getting out of the bed. And so in our unit, the D part, when the patient is delirious, we say to ourselves, like the pilot, if there's some sort of warning signal in the plane, the pilot says, let me get out my checklist. We say, let's get our delirium checklist out. It's the Dr. Dre. D, D, R, E. And uh, so disease, drug removal, and environment. And yeah, I wrote to Dr. Dre. I, I asked to use his picture and his name. He, he didn't write back. I'm taking that as a yes. Um, and uh, we, we use this every day in our unit, and we use it all over the world. If the patient is CAM positive, I say, did you run the Dr. Dre? The nurse tells me, yeah, we looked over them for newly found sepsis, COPD, CHF, flow and infection issues. We're removing the psychoactive drugs they don't need anymore, and we're getting them out of the bed, putting on hearing aids, eyeglasses, et cetera. A few weeks ago, I had a guy, by the way, John Baker. He allowed me to use his name, and he was doing great after an NSTEMI and pneumonia. And on day six of the unit, he got profoundly delirious, started cussing at his wife. He was a pure gentleman before that, and I thought, what in the hell? And uh, I told the fellow, this guy's going down. This is really bad. And for three days, I'd seen this biography of Roosevelt on his bed, and he was telling me how he was reading all of the biographies of all the U.S. presidents. And I never saw him reading that book. And so I kept asking him, why aren't you reading? He said, well, my glasses are broken. I said, well, you know, why don't you get your wife to give you new glasses, and she never did. And that day he got delirious, I finally thought about the E. Bozo doctor that I am, I should have given him some solution several days earlier, but anyway, that day, 
when I left rounds, I gave him my glasses. And the next morning I walked in and Mr. Baker was sitting there reading that Roosevelt biography, brain clear as a whistle, not cussing at his wife anymore and doing a beautiful job with his, with his brain. So it was clearly sensory deprivation as the, as the etiology of his delirium. Nothing else major was detected on the Dr. Dre. Don't tell me that you can't change the culture in your unit to get people up and walking. This is a great picture we published in CCM of, of Kasha, Kasha Kotfuss provided of one of her patients. The woman is failing her SBT because of ARDS. Her husband is in blue there. And all you had to have was a nurse, a nurse's aide pushing a chair behind her, and she's walking with her husband's help. So this does not take uh, a physical therapist. I mean, I love our physical therapists, but when they're not around, we walk our patients anyway. And there are about 25 papers already published on this bundle. If you don't like it because of the, it's cutesy and it involves the alphabet, figure out your own way to do these things. But modify your habits in the unit to do what the patients need you to do. And quit thinking that your solution to their delirium is writing for a drug, because it's not. You might be writing to stop a drug, uh, but most importantly, it's about letting the patient wake up get moving, and be back to the land of the living. Now, upon which data do I say this? I'll just show you two of the over 20 investigations of the ADA F bundle. Uh, this is one. 6,000 patients in the Sutter Health System in California. You're looking at two graphs. Both of the graphs have the same structure. On the x-axis, you've got percent compliance with the bundle. On the y-axis, you've got percent of survival, and percent freedom from delirium and coma. So you see, as you go up in compliance across the x-axis, you see a steady rise, a 15% increase in survival per 10% added compliance. And on the com coma delirium side, you see a 15% rise in freedom from delirium and coma as you go up in compliance. And that's after adjusting for severity of illness, age, and on or off the ventilator. So that's 6,000 patients. Add another 15, and you've got now over 20,000 patients worth of data. This whole thing right here occurred because uh, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, went and got sick, profoundly delirious, hated his experience, called the SECM and said, look, we're going to give some money from the Gordon and Moore Foundation if you can come up with a way to help it be done better for ICU patients. So they asked if I would be the PI of this thing. I was very thankful to be a member of all of these uh, brains, brainiacs uh, of the IC Liberation Program. And we published these 15,000 patients worth of data. And here's basically what we figured out. In the out of study setting, where you couldn't pick a dirtier set of environments in terms of small hospitals, big hospitals, federal hospitals, public hospitals, private hospitals, all of that, I thought there's no way we're going to see signal in this, but we still did. And by the way, in science, the most convincing bit of evidence we can get is a dose response. And so after adjusting for 18 covariates of all of the things you would think would be controlling survival and length of stay, et cetera, after all of those adjustments, we still saw that compliance with this bundle was the most robust predictor in this circumstance for hospital discharge and in this case, for reduction in death. As you go up the y-axis, you, you go left on the x to see reductions in the likelihood of dying. And that's what we wanted to see. Now, we also saw reductions in coma, delirium, and physical restraint use. I said to everybody at the beginning, if patients are more awake and less delirious, we better see more pain. Or something is really wrong here because they're able to tell us about their pain. And we did see that. I didn't show the graph here because of brevity, but we see an increase in pain. And it's not that we want to see more pain, but we want to know about the patient's pain. If they're delirious or non-communicative, we won't know they, whether or not they're in that pain. But in this case, with the bundle, we can have a communicative patient telling us what matters to them and what's important on that particular day. And then these are my two favorite graphs from the whole ICU liberation program, reductions in ICU readmission, and reductions in discharge to nursing homes. So I'll close here with this quote. I was down in Argentina and this doctor said to me, 
uh, Dr. Ely, I think that the classic care of critically ill patients is similar to a dementia factory. It is up to us to close the factory. So the next step in our research in this area is we've just gotten $18 million from the NIA to do Brain 2. And what we're going to do in Brain 2 is we are taking our patients who are on ventilators, ele elective, uh, excuse me, emergently ill, on vent or in shock patients in surgical and medical ICUs, and we are going to follow them similarly to the way that we followed them in Brain 1, but we're adding on a very extensive uh, biomarker approach with both serum plasma biomarkers, CSF biomarkers, and radiological biomarkers with all of the spectrum of, of uh, radiological uh, new technology that you talked about, including DTI, um, et cetera, vascular. It's going to be great. And, um, and then we were also establishing this tissue repository of the brains of these patients when they die. And we're working very closely with David Bennett, whom you mentioned at the very beginning. David Bennett, it's going to be a Rush Vanderbilt project. And uh, I'm very thankful to be a part of this idea of figuring out exactly what is the mechanism and the neuropathology that these patients are experiencing. We are also doing uh, cognitive rehabilitation research with iPads. And we're working with um, Adam Ghazali and Mike Merzenich, both from UCSF, Evo and Brain HQ to try and see if their cognitive rehab programs can help our ICU survivors. So far, the cognitive rehab programs we've been using have been able to take patients who are around 50, leave with a 65-year-old brain, and over 12 weeks get them back into the low 50s in terms of age brain function. So we do see that this is a rehabable, or I say a get-backable version of dementia, and I'm hoping that the acute onset of this disease uh, will allow these patients to lead, lead a much more normal life and have a higher success rate than we have seen with the Alzheimer's interventions. So I'm still a little short on time here. Uh, I'm going to stop there and look forward to any questions you might have at the end. Thank you so much.